All right, so where we've left off in 1155, um, a small event takes place that no one really knows at this time is going to change the history of Japan forever. But it was the death of the young child emperor Konoe. He passes away in 1155. He was very sickly. And it's a sort of unique case because he was still a child. He didn't have any heirs. But he had two brothers, uh, Prince Sutoku and Prince Goshirakawa. Okay, they were his brothers. Both of them wanted to be the emperor, and Konoe had not designated an heir. So you have two princes who both want to be emperors, and they both have a very you know equally strong claim to the throne. They're both the brothers of the deceased emperor. So who's going to be the next emperor? Nobody knows. Okay. Uh, this is a perfect excuse for the people who are jockeying for power behind the scenes to try to get their place back in power, right? So the Fujiwara regents see this as a perfect opportunity to get rid of the retired emperor system. They said, perfect. There's no retired emperor right now because Konoe was a young child. So there, you know, the, the previous retired emperor had already passed. And Konoe had still been too young. He didn't have a child, so he could retire and become the retired emperor. So there's no retired emperor. So the Fujiwara regents say, aha, here's a perfect chance to get rid of that stupid retired emperor system and get our power back altogether. Okay? So they support Prince Sutoku, who tells the Fujiwara regents, okay, guys, if you want some of your power back, if I become emperor, I'm not going to retire. I will not be a retired emperor. I will stay emperor, and I will let you guys have your old power back. So if you support me, I will let you guys be regents and have a complete power, just like the good old days of the Heian period. So the Fujiwara say, okay, we're going to support Prince Stoku. The other prince, Goshirakawa, hated the Fujiwara regents. Okay, he, did not, he actually did not have a Fujiwara mother because he was a third son. He, there was Nobody thought he would ever become the emperor, so his mother was a concubine, a lesser uh, a lesser, you know, she was not of noble birth. She was not an aristocrat. So, you know, she, he had no reason to support the Fujiwara family. And actually, he completely disliked them. He said, I don't want them to have any role in the government. Okay, they, they, have, they had some role before. If I'm emperor, I'm going to get rid of them altogether. I want, I want nothing to do with them at all. Okay, so you see the uh, match being lighted that's going to ignite a little bit of a civil war. exactly what happened. Um, there was a civil war in 1156 known as the Hogan Rebellion. And this was basically a war, a succession dispute between two princes who wanted to be emperor. And what did the two princes do? They decide to use the Taira and Minamoto clans who are in Kyoto, very influential, the warrior clans, to do the fighting on their behalf. Okay. And so, you know, they don't want to do the fighting. Aristocrats can't go to war. So who are they going to ask to do the fighting for them? The warriors. What better person, right? Uh, interestingly enough, Kiyomori and Yoshitomo, who were rivals, found themselves on the same side for once. Okay, They both supported Goshirakawa, Prince Goshirakawa. And the reason they both supported Goshirakawa is because one thing that Kiyomori and Yoshitomo had in common is that they both hated the Fujiwara. Remember, the, the warrior class has little to associate, little in common with the aristocrats. Um, keep in mind that they had been in Kyoto for a little while, and while they were in Kyoto, the Fujiwara regents embarrassed them. They would invite them to waka parties, and when they couldn't you know, follow along with poetry, they would make fun of them, they would humiliate them. And so you know, neither Kiyomori nor Yoshitomo liked the Fujiwara. So they said, good, if Goshirakawa is promising to get rid of the Fujiwara, let's support him. Why not? So the both warrior families are on the side of Goshirakawa, okay? But the Fujiwara and Prince Toku, they played, they fought back dirty. What they did is, when they saw that both the Taira and Minamoto family heads were allying against him, the Fujiwara would hire, they would bribe members of the Taira and Minamoto family to fight on their side. So what they would... They pulled aside, for example, Kiyomori's brother. And they said, Taira no Kiyomori's brother. And they said, oh, well, your brother, the clan leader, is on their side. But if he loses and we win, you'll be the head of the clan. So they would, you know, bribe them to come and fight for them. They did the same thing with uh, Minamoto no Yoshitomo. Actually, uh, Yoshitomo's father was brought by the Fujiwara to their side. They, they, you know, they created some intrigue. He said, she said stuff, you know, gossip. Oh, Yoshitomo was saying this about you. And, you know, they, they made the father angry and they brought him to their side. 
So the Fujiwara played, they, they played very dirty, okay? They, they tried to tear the family apart. So you had family members, Taira and Minamoto, on different sides. Father killing son, son killing father, brothers kill, uh, fighting against each other. Um, it, it, was not, it was not pleasant. Uh, but eventually the Goshirakawa faction, who of course they had the support of both the leaders of Taira and Minamoto clans, you don't want to mess with them, they prove victorious and they win the Hogan Rebellion, this mini-civil war. So what happens? Prince Tutoku was not executed. He was exiled to a, temp a Buddhist temple. Remember, he is, at the end of the day, a divine being. He's a member of the imperial family, so they can't kill him. He's just exiled. What happens to the Fujiwara? Well, you know, they could have been executed, but they had been around for a long time, too. They're an old aristocratic family. So what happens to them is they're actually able to keep their political title. They, they, there's actually Fujiwara regents that exist for the next thousand years until eight, you know, or 900 years until the 1800s. You have Fujiwara regents uh, in, in power, but I use the term power very loosely because they had no political power. The regent, imperial regent title and system becomes a completely symbolic title. Doesn't mean anything. Their political power and influence is completely eliminated. Okay, and actually, as a result of this Hogan Rebellion, not only the influence of the Fujiwara family, but the political power and influence of aristocrats, which had been, which had really dominated the Han period, is drawn to a close. From now on, the people who are going to be defining political and public policy are going to be the warrior class, because look at what a very, very important role they played to help Goshirakawa win the civil war against uh, the Fujiwara, and so the Fujiwara clan ceases to be an influence in Japanese history, although they do keep a symbolic title that really doesn't mean anything, but in Kyoto they're allowed to continue doing what they do best, which is writing poetry and enjoying the sights and the music and the art, but their political power is gone, okay? So what happens to Goshirakawa? Well, he becomes the emperor, okay, and he knows that he, has, he couldn't have done it without the warrior class, so he says, we're going to end this aristocratic society. I want to ask you, the heads of the Taira and Minamoto families, Kiyomori and Yoshitomo, to help me rule. Because I'm done with the aristocratic stuff. Let's create a new Japan. So at the end of the Heian period, Japan becomes a warrior society. The aristocrats are still there, but you know they're, it's just a hobby for them now. They don't really have any political clout or political power. They just have the money. In terms of the government, warriors are now involved in the government, helping the emperor rule. So the emperor used to have the aristocrats helping him out. Now he has the warriors on his side who are going to be creating a new government. Okay, so Kiyomori and Yoshitomo are going to equally be involved in creating a new government. Do you think they can work together? Remember, these two are fierce rivals. They happen to find themselves on the same side. Can they work together? We'll see. Unfortunately, it's not going to end so well. So with the Fujiwara out of the picture now, uh, Taira no Kiyomori and Minamoto no Yoshitomo, they are warriors who are helping the emperor with his government. Okay? And you know, Goshirakawa's premise was he wanted to create a new Japan. He said, I want to, you know, the, the Fujiwara ruined the government because they were only focusing on Kyoto. People are starving in the provinces. I want to help the people in the poor provinces and improve their quality of life. Okay, and Kiyomori and Yoshitomo agreed, of course, because they were also from the provinces. So they said, what a perfect plan. It was so beautiful. They could have created a new country together. But Kiyomori and Yoshitomo were fierce rivals. They, they were simply not able to put aside their rivalry. From the get-go, there was little digs Kiyomori would make, and Yoshitomo would get upset. Remember, Yoshitomo has no filter. He would just get upset at him, throw a tantrum. They would fight. There'd be drama. And so from the get-go, it was just bickering and drama. Uh, in 1158, Goshirakawa shows that he really has no intention of reforming anything because he goes back to the old tricks of what the imperial family used to do. He retires, and he becomes the retired emperor, and his son becomes the new emperor. So clearly, you know, Goshirakawa was talking about, let's create a new Japan, and let's stop focusing on political squabbles in Kyoto. Well, he's doing the same thing that his ancestors did. He's, he becomes a Buddhist monk. He becomes a retired emperor, so he can maneuver power behind the scenes. Okay, 
And at the same time, Goshirakawa really starts to show signs that he doesn't really care about the warriors as much as he pretended he did two years before. They helped him win the civil war, so now they don't really need, he doesn't really need them anymore. So Goshirakawa was a political mastermind who was, would stir the pot, create a big mess, and then would step back and watch the show while eating his popcorn and looking at what would transpire. So that's exactly what he did with Kiyomori and Yoshitomo. Goshirakawa, for some reason, favored the Taira clan. Okay, So what he would do is, when he created his new government, Goshirakawa would give Kiyomori and the Taira clan all the good positions in government. All the top bureaucratic offices in Kyoto were run by Taira clan members with Minamoto assistance. Okay? Uh, the Taira got all the good court titles. They got all the beautiful mansions. They got all the favors. Yoshitomo and the Minamoto clan were ignored. Okay? And there was one incident where uh, Yoshitom, um, Kiyomori received a title from you know, the emperor, Goshirakawa, and uh, Yoshitomo didn't get one. So Yoshitomo went to the emperor and said, could you please, you know, uh, what about me, right? He said, okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you a good title. So Yoshitomo waits, and the title he receives is the keeper of the imperial horse stables. You're in charge of cleaning the horses in the imperial palace. Yoshitomo was furious. He said, what an insult. And then everyone told him, Kiyomori said, well, it's the imperial palace. You know, they're imperial horses, not, reg you know, Yoshitomo was furious. So he, you know, little things, little digs like this, that's one example, but constantly it's a barrage of similar issues, and Yoshitomo gets fed up with the government. Okay, he says, we fought together against Sutoku and the Fujiwara, and now, how come he's getting all the good favors? So he had enough, Yoshitomo's patience ran out, and in 1159, he and the Minamoto clan, his family, rebelled against Kiyomori and the Taira. Okay? Interesting that he's not rebelling against Goshirakawa, right? He's, uh, he's rebelling against the Taira because Yoshitomo is not upset at the emperor or the retired emperor by this point, Goshirakawa. He's upset at the Taira because in his mind, Kiyomori is the one who is, you know, making, changing Goshirakawa's mind about the Minamoto, where in reality, Goshirakawa was the one simply stirring the pot. This is what he wanted. He wanted them to fight and eliminate each other so that the imperial family could enjoy all the power. That was his goal, too. Everyone is in it for their own uh, good. So this civil war between the Minamoto and the Taira is a second civil war in just three years, the Heiji Rebellion of 1159. And this time it was really a showdown between the Minamoto and the Taira clans. Okay. And uh, Yoshitomo and the Minamoto did something quite interesting. They captured retired Emperor Goshirakawa and took him hostage. Uh, and this was not to harm Goshirakawa. This is because, again, in Yoshitomo's mind, Kiyomori was trying to get to Goshirakawa and manipulate him. In, in, this is what Yoshitomo thought. So he thought, if we take Goshirakawa and protect him from the Taira, we'll win. That was their intent. They had no intent to harm Goshirakawa. And their other goal was to conquer Kyoto from the Taira and get rid of the Taira in the capital city. Okay, so this is basically a recipe for disaster because the Taira see this as you're really kidnapping the retired emperor. Are you, are you really stooping this low? And in the kerfuffle, Goshirakawa's palace was even put on fire by accident. This is a big deal. Okay, you've never had fighting like this in Kyoto before, ever. Okay. Um, so the aristocrats are upset because they said, oh, these, these boorish warriors came to the capital city and, and, and destroyed it because of their fighting, even though Goshirakawa was the one who was, you know, stirring the pot. So this scene of Goshirakawa's palace being put, you know, burned, d destroyed in fire, there's a very famous Yamato-style picture scroll, remember the Emaki scrolls, called the Burning of the Sanjo Palace. It's a perfect example of Yamato-style painting. As you can see here, there is no, you know, oblique view with no ceiling, lots of pastel colors, and you cannot see the expressions of the uh, people. That's the three uh, characteristics of Yamato painting. And this is another example. That's Goshirakawa in the palanquin, and the Minamoto have taken him hostage to, quote-unquote, protect him from the Taira. Okay?
And remember, Goshirakawa prefers the Taira, so he doesn't want to go with the Minamoto. And eventually, the Taira clan rescue Goshirakawa. They, they rescue him, and they crush the Minamoto for good. Okay, So they, they, they win. The Taira clan wins. And Goshirakawa, the retired emperor, is rescued. Kiyomori, as I told you, is very vindictive. He doesn't let anybody go. So what happens to Minamoto no Yoshitomo and his relatives? Okay, he had some. He had he had two or three older boys who had helped him. He had brothers and cousins. All of them are brutally wiped out and executed. In 1159, Kiyomori takes no prisoners. He has everybody put to death. So Yoshitomo is beheaded, put to death, executed. Okay. Yoshitomo had two younger sons, though he had two two sons that were that were younger children, and you know. Kiyomori initially wanted to put them to death. Uh, Yoritomo was about, I think, 11. He was still a boy. And Yoshitsune was an infant. He had just been born. So these, these are kids. What is Kiyomori going to do? Initially, Kiyomori wanted to have them put to death. He said, you know, I, I'm not taking any prisoners. These kids are going to grow up, and they're going to come after me and take revenge on, for their father. So I want to get rid of them. But Kiyomori's uh, stepmother begged with her stepson. She said, please save their lives. She was actually reminded of her son. Um, Kiyomori had a younger brother who had died of illness when, when he was younger. Uh, she said, you know, he reminds me of, 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 the, of my son. You know, I, I, please don't kill them. So she pleads and begs with her stepson. And Kiyomori listens to his stepmom and spares the two boys' lives. Everyone else was executed, the Minamoto family. So what does he do with them? He's not going to let them stay in Kyoto. So Yoritomo, the older boy, is exiled to the city of Kamakura. At that time, Kamakura was a small village far away in northern Honshu. It's right by Tokyo. At that time, there was nothing in Tokyo. It was, it was a small fishing village, if that. Very isolated, very far from the capital of Kyoto. So he was sent there basically to live his life. Okay? And Kiyomori thought, if he gets sent there... Nothing's going to happen. You know, he's going to be completely um, insignificant for the rest of my life. He might even die out there for all we know. Yoshitsune, the baby, was exiled to a Buddhist temple outside of Kyoto. And the condition was, you could, since he's a baby, he doesn't remember anything. So you cannot tell him anything about his past. Don't tell him that he's the son of the Minamoto clan. He will grow up, you know, not knowing anything. So what happens now that the Minamoto is eliminated? Power is entirely in the hands of Taira no Kiyomori and the Taira clan. He doesn't need to share power with the Minamoto anymore. So what does Kiyomori do? He moves to Kyoto permanently with his entire family so he can rule the country by himself on behalf of, you know, the retired emperor Goshirakawa. So you still have, you know, the imperial family, but instead of the Fujiwara being the power behind the throne, power behind the throne is going to be the Taira warrior clan. Okay, so you have one family being switched up with another but the main person at the top, the figurehead ruler, is still the emperor. And this is a common theme of Japanese.